good evening everybody and welcome back to the table welcome back to the channel uh, tonight I'm going to do something a little bit different I'm gonna try to do uh, for lack of a better word a speed session which basically is when I do a little bit of something on a lot of bit of things you know in a set amount of time sometimes you don't really feel like sitting somewhere for an hour an hour and a half working on one thing like you know like when I was building the MDF buildings but you want to feel like you got some things done so you do a little bit of a lot of different stuff and so that's what we're gonna do tonight nothing I guess nothing major what I'm starting with here is these are like some subway cars that I bought uh, from Walmart and at the time they actually had graffiti on them but I spray painted them and kind of put my own coloring to make them look a little more realistic because the cars were kind of cartoony but when I did that I had to cover up the graffiti so I bought these uh, decals uh, off of eBay somebody sells these I think it's mostly for model train guys but what I want to do is try to get some of these on some of these cars, see how they look. And, uh, you know, I'll just decide if I'm going to put in more on there. I may try to put these on some buildings, but primarily this is for, for my Spectre Operations games. So, you know, it doesn't have to be perfect, but that just gives you an idea of what I'm doing. I don't remember the name of the of the series that these were in I know the last time I was at a store called Ollie's they still had some there uh, I have not seen them in Walmart in a while but I did do a video uh, so if you look at any of my Ollie's videos I may have picked it up in there and showed it to you so but I'm gonna try to I'm gonna try to see if I can get some uh, decals on there so what I thought I'd talk about tonight was something that's probably more relevant to me than most of you, but I don't know. You know, judging from the world economy, you know, it may be relevant to everybody. And that subject is the different ways or how many different ways are there to make money from your hobby? And I mean, obviously, I'm, I'm mostly talking about our hobby of miniature wargaming. But, I mean, obviously, if you have other hobbies, trains, and things, it may apply. And so, I'm just going to kind of go through some of the things that have come across my head. And maybe why I root them out. Or, you know, if I'm thinking about trying them. And then hopefully you guys can put some ideas you've had or maybe something you've done in the comments. And I guess the, the first biggest thing that I know everybody's waiting to come out of my mouth is making YouTube videos. And, you know, if that was if that was a real possibility to actually make money, I think it would be I think it would probably be the best of both worlds because the work would basically involve just working on stuff you wanted to work on anyway and sharing it with people. Uh, the, unfortunately the reality is very few people will ever make any kind of money uh, through YouTube videos even, even the ones with two three thousand uh, subscribers maybe even ten thousand subscribers you know they're not gonna make no money that you can pay bills or anything and that's that's kind of what I'm talking about I'm not talking about oh I'm gonna make enough money to buy some more stuff you know that's that's not essential to be able to buy some more stuff but if you're trying to support yourself and pr pretty much I am talking about people that are on their own because I don't really think if you have a family that's viable again not for most people but uh, you know, so really you're not going to make money off of YouTube. I mean, unless just something crazy happens and you blow up and, you know, all of a sudden you've got three, four hundred thousand subscribers. And I mean, there's a there's a handful of guys out here that, that have that. Uh, and the biggest way to blow up, and I'm not sure if people realize this, but 
really the biggest way to blow up other than just some crazy video that goes viral for some unknown reason the most common way that people blow up is another large channel sees their channel and they basically put it out there for people and you know overnight you can pick up tens of thousands of subscribers uh, that is the biggest way to blow up but also most big channels are very uh, how should I say they're very selfish or protective with any channel they mention I've seen a lot of big channels who will say they saw a technique or they heard about a topic on another channel but they will refuse them to give the name of that channel or give that channel any credit because they're afraid the channel is going to blow up right they're afraid all their subscribers are going to go check out the person's channel now typically when they do give it out it's usually because they've already spoke with the person ahead of time and you know I guess they've given that person their their blessing to to blow up and so they say okay I'll mention you but somebody just seeing your channel typically is not going to share it with their uh, with their subscribers even if they know you know even if they admit yeah I saw this on another YouTube channel and uh, you know that's where I got my idea to try it so but like I said so that's you know that's kind of one way you know you just you kind of do this whole YouTube channel thing uh, and so if we if we move from that because I just wanted to get that out the way real quick uh, Now the thing about these decals is you can actually put them on sideways. Is you don't necessarily want them all on here straight like you're you're decorating, because <laughs> that's not what graffiti is supposed to be. But uh, so if you root that out, right? If you just say, "Look, I, I know that's not going to happen," you know, then what's some other areas? Now in the past, there used to be writing. To be honest with you. That was a very uh, popular way of of trying to make a living off, off of a, uh, your hobby. You know, a lot of the old magazines, miniature war gaming, uh, war games illustrated, Courier. A lot of them, you know, a lot of people made an income writing for these these magazines. They would get paid per word or per submission. I mean, I don't know if they supported their family, but kind of once you got published in one magazine, you could, uh, you know, you could kind of uh, leverage that into more articles for other magazines, you know, and maybe even at one time you could leverage it into a book. Man, these things tear up quick coming off of here. It's, you got to be quick. You know, you could leverage that into something like a book, a book deal, uh, which again is is a way of making money off of the hobby. Uh, and I remember, you know, back in the day, that was kind of the ultimate. If you could, if you could write a book and get your book published, you know, that was kind of the ultimate in, in whatever hobby you were pursuing. Uh, Nowadays, I mean, there there are a few. Uh, I think there's probably two, to be honest with you. I don't have their names right now. Two guys I know that are kind of the, that have kind of taken over the reins, and they actually have books that get published. One of them has like a series. I think he has like one called War Gaming and one called Solo War Gaming and things like that. I can't. His name's on the top of my lips. If I was. If I was by my library, I could tell you who I'm talking about, but I'm not. Uh, so I'm sure he, I'm sure he, he gets a nice little side income every couple of years or so writing. And of course, you do got guys like Gorilla Miniatures and uh, Joseph McCullough, 
who make some side income or some extra income writing their books. Although I would I don't I don't know whether they get paid on sales or whether they get paid just a flat fee. You know, I don't know how Osprey does that. Uh and interestingly enough, I don't know. I think maybe I think Gorilla Miniatures has like a new game out by a new publisher because I was about to say I, I'm not sure if either one of them have really leveraged that into other publishers. I know Joseph McCullough, as far as I know, all his stuff is through Osprey. So I don't know if they have some kind of exclusive with him or that's just who he prefers to work with. So you got those two. You got... You know, a YouTube channel, which I'd say for the average person, uh, you're probably going to make like $100 a year. Right? That's probably what I make on my channel uh, if I'm putting up videos. You know, after about a year, you know, I may make $100. That's like $10, maybe $9, $8 a month. Something like $8 a month. And then, of course, there's writing. Uh, so if you write... And there's two types. I mean, you can just write a book, which is kind of informational, or you can write a set of game rules. And I don't think they're the same. I think, obviously, to me, an informational book has a lot more... Uh, I think it has a lot more... Uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Audience. It has a bigger audience. Like if you're just doing a book on wargaming or model training or whatever, I think you're going to have a much bigger audience than somebody that's doing a specific set of rules, you know, how to armor mech combat. Because there's a lot of people even in the hobby who aren't going to buy any rules on armored mech combat because they don't, they don't play armored mech combat. So that's something, you know... You know, that's something where, you know, if, you, if you're getting paid by the number of sales, you know, your sales are going to be somewhere less than the total people in the hobby, which is really not a lot of people, you know, compared to the general, the general book market. But I don't know. I would, I would say on average, and like I said, I haven't seen their contracts, but I'd say when these guys put out a book, probably on average... We'll just show you what some of these look like. So I'm going to let these kind of dry on here and then probably hit them with some uh, glue. Go over them with some glue later just to make sure they don't pop off when my hands touch them. Because I don't know if I have any decals set. I'll see. But if I do, you can use that. So I'm going to do the other one real quick because I don't want you guys to sit here while I do that. And then I will be back with the next item. okay we are back and for this I am going to be working on these air houses and really all I'm gonna try to do is paint these kind of wood posts wooden posts that are sticking out there uh, I may do the doors if I if this goes pretty quick but I don't I don't anticipate it being too quick because it's gonna involve a little bit of detail painting although I don't have my smock on so maybe I should should I get my smock yeah I'm gonna I gotta get my smock come on Ugh. can't can't we can't be painting without our smock what would Mr. Rogers think of me oh there we go so now we're at the paint table guys and so we're gonna put this on yeah Oh. I'm gonna tie this down. And then tie this one down. And we're gonna head back to the table with our nice little smock on. So, probably don't need it, but hey, if I needed it, I wouldn't have bought it. <laughs> I just like it. So. Mm, no. So we have our smock. 
Now, back to what we were talking about as far as the different ways of trying to make money off of a hobby. And basic, obviously, we're talking about modern age, so. But, uh. Because in the past, there wouldn't have been any YouTube. Hard as that is to believe. But, uh. So we said YouTube, we said a book, or I guess publishing. Obviously, painting. And I will say. I have inadvertently made money off of my hobby painting. But I guess there's two types of painting. One is obviously commission painting, which I've never done. But the other is just simply selling stuff that you have that is that you've painted. Now, I will tell you, people do not pay you for an average paint job. You know, what we call tabletop quality or soldier ready or whatever just eye level you are not going to get you know compensated for the time and effort you put into paint to that level i mean i've actually sold miniatures that were painted for less than what you could have got for those same miniatures just bare metal and i mean i think that's probably not too surprising considering people have different tastes and if something is not real good and it's also not to their taste they're just not going to pay for it and just about all the painted stuff that I've sold I've auctioned so I mean obviously if if, if there was somebody who really liked it they could have they could have bid it up until they got it but I would say on average if you sell five painted miniatures like say five soldiers or fantasy figures you're probably going to get about $15. Now, there are people on eBay who sell professionally painted stuff. And I've seen, you know, they'll, they'll paint up an army and it'll go for, you know, $300. And I'm not talking about like a GW 2000 point army. I'm talking about like maybe, maybe an airborne squad or something. Uh... And as far as I know, these are legitimate auctions, not not all that fake stuff you see where, you know, they claim something sold for $5,000, which I just think that's plain old money laundering. Because if you get that same item and try to sell it, it won't come nowhere near that. And I'm not talking about painting stuff. I'm just talking about odd, odd listings on eBay that indicate somebody sold something for you know five thousand dollars just some random game but so i mean obviously painting is something you can paint stuff i mean people there are some people i know people who only collect painted miniatures so i mean there is kind of a market out there of people who don't want to paint their own stuff and you know if they if they buy something they look to try to find it already painted for them by somebody uh so that is a viable source but i think in order for you to really make money doing that you would probably need to have a source of just where you would get the miniatures pretty much free because if you're paying you know forty dollars for a box of boat action figures and you're going to paint up this squad that you get in that box at some tabletop level i mean you're probably going to get about forty dollars you know if it's a squad of 30 figures you know you can probably expect to make about 40 bucks and so you haven't you, you're not making any progress you're not making any money so you would have to have some way of getting at least getting the figures free and then that way whatever you make from your your painting work would be would be extra that would be your income but that's another that's another area in another way we can add that to the list so we have we have YouTube videos we have uh, what else did we say YouTube oh publishing or writing we have painting 
and then obviously the next obvious is I'm, I'm trying to hit all the obvious stuff first the next one is making terrain and so this is going to be guys like uh what's his name luke towen i don't know i think he's called Ga Ga geek gamers or something now or game Ga geek gaming scenics or something so guys like him i imagine the terrain tutor at one point uh i have i'm sure made a lot of money not a lot of money but i'm sure they they make good income building custom built terrain for people I mean, because if you're, say, you're making a board of a Normandy landing, you know, you may charge somebody $700 for that. And so, I mean, that's good money. But if it takes you two months to do it, obviously, you're not going to be able to pay your bills. Two months worth of bills with $700. And then how many of those can you work on at the same time in two months? And I don't know, so I'm not I'm not gonna say one way or another whether that's actually viable or not. So let me show you what we've got here. And I may have to put a wash on this, but this stuff is small. You can just throw some Agrax Earth Shade on there. You don't have to go with the whole custom wash. But this just kind of shows you what we're what we're working with with this is just to. To get this uh, to bring it up to life a bit and I mean I didn't want to think about this too much so I'm just kind of sticking to these three colors uh, I was gonna lead it I was gonna lead a door this color as the building but I think I think it looks better kind of with this darker brown uh, and then I'll do I'll I'll put a wash over it too. And you know, and that's pretty much all you have to do for the outside of a building like that. Now you could dry brush that door a little bit, you know, lighten the brown, put some of this tan in with that brown. I may I may do that. But for the time being, I mean this to me looks you know, this looks solid. Now I've got I've got two more of these to do. So we're going to go away for a second and we're going to work on those two. And when we come back, you guessed it, we will have the next item on the table cuz this is just kind of a round robin of stuff where I just want to get a little bit of a little bit of this and a little bit of that done okay and so we will be back all right guys so we are back we've got the next item on the table and I don't know if you guys can hear me so let me uh, give me one second I'm trying to find my uh... oh wait Trying to find my Steino res. Ah, I think I'm gonna have to go get up and find it. Okay, so I found the Steino res, <clears throat> and so Steino res. This is basically a uh, primer, paint on primer. Probably the most commonly one used for hobbyists. Now this is a see if you can hear this so this is a porcelain building Santa's workbench collection 2000 Canterbury Lane Church and I don't remember where I bought it but I glued this door on from games workshop because there's a hole there was a hole here like for a birdhouse or something and obviously that won't do for gaming but I never got around to actually painting the door so what we're gonna do tonight is we're simply gonna cover this with some uh, brush on primer and then in another episode we will paint this I guess uh, 
haven't quite figured out how I want to paint it, but I'm thinking I will probably paint it like a tan color and then uh, just put a wash on it. Maybe a ruddy, kind of a ruddy, what did they used to call that? Uh, I don't know. You know the red wash, Reich, Reichland flesh shade or something? I don't know what it's called now, but kind of a reddish wash. Maybe throw a little brown in there. And then that should do it. Then we pick out the metal bars uh, or the metal bracing of the doors. And I think it'll look nice. I mean, obviously it can't open, but we don't need it to open. This is just a table piece. For a game like boat action, uh, specter operations, uh, heck, I think you can even use this for some medieval games. So you can get a lot of mileage out of this. I, I should look this up and see how much it normally costs, because maybe I should have sold this on eBay. But I guess it's too late now with this door on here. Uh, well, maybe that would add to the value. I'm trying not to get any paint on the back of the church, so. Yeah, I think that actually looks pretty good. <clears throat> now we gotta let that dry. Alright, guys, so we are back. This time I have put some more of my uh, Rubicon models, North Vietnamese, on the table. So my, my ideal is to try to get five of these done up per night and basically after six nights I should have all 30 that come in the box completed um, once you learn how to do these they're not actually that hard uh, but you definitely have to have the right glue you cannot use uh, liquid cement on here or I guess that's that's what it's called although you you're gonna need to use this plastic well and I would also say don't try to use crazy glue because that is that is a mess but if you use this plastic weld which basically is for ABS I think that's what it's called and this is plastic well if you use this man it's going to make your life a lot easier trying to put together all 30 of these miniatures because they are quite fibbly man I don't know this one this one doesn't want to stay which usually I don't have that and there is a lot of sprue you got to clean up so it does take a while that's why I'm only trying to do five a night because otherwise you can kind of get uh, frustrated or you know get kind of burnt out sitting here fidgeting with these things but I found doing five is just right and it's like I was telling you guys the other night all you want to do is make sure you know you're, you're just you're just platooning your pieces or assembly line in them so these are both the same body so I'm doing five like maybe three of this configuration and two of that and that's that's pretty much what you see what you see down here uh, so like this one I'm gonna swap this other uh, weapon in and then the rest of the, the body is the same now some of them if you swap if you swap the arm out for example the weapon arm then you have I me mean, to swap the weapon out you have to also change the arm that goes with that weapon but for this particular character or figure configuration figure you don't have to do that so I don't know why my ABS is drying up too quick you know it's like before it gets the most although some of these I think I might have left a little bit too much flash. So, 
if you work it a bit, you will notice that it is, uh, you can kind of notice when it starts to melt, the plastic starts to bond. But I think I'm just going a little too fast. So we will slow down. But anyway, back to what we were talking about. So we were saying you can make money doing terrain, which, you know, I would say that's a semi-specialized type of skill because, again, nobody's going to pay you to make like a, a clop of trees or some hedges out of some, uh, some bathroom sponges and things like that or Brillo pads. So, you know, if, if you're going to do terrain, then you're probably going to need to be able to do some very, very realistic terrain effects if you're going to earn anything. But then even with that, right, like I said, so say you, you score a big job once a month. I mean, but, but the job pays, I don't know, like I said, let's just say $700. Now, I imagine you could make more. There's probably convention pieces where, you know, maybe you could charge a club a thousand or fifteen hundred. I'd assume. I mean, that's a lot of money for a display. You know, if you're doing something for a museum, maybe. But for I think that the 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 average professional terrain builder. Probably is going to charge somewhere between five and seven hundred. So, again, it's income, but it's not anything that you're going to be able to pay your bills with on a consistent basis. You're gonna, you know, you're gonna have to be doing something else. So we talked about YouTubing. We talked about painting. We talked about writing. We talked about doing terrain. So the next area of the hobby, and this is actually probably, you don't see this as much, but it's kind of like demoing or playing games. And a lot of companies used to pay people or representatives to like set up their games in stores and, and play the games. So, and I don't know whether they always got paid money or whether they were just paid in product. I think it was some of both. Uh, but say for example, like Magic the Card Game, if that's your hobby, you can make a lot of money running Magic tournaments as an official, you know, whatever the term is, somebody that's uh, authorized to run a tournament, right? And, and a lot of times the store will pay you to come and put a tournament on because they make a lot of money you know, when they fill that store up with people paying a registration fee, people buying cards, people buying snacks, people buying other stuff on their shelves. And I knew, uh, I think there was a time back when I was still in Michigan, and this was all pre-COVID, where some of the people that did that, I mean, they could make like a $1,000 to run a, to run a tournament for a store. You know, and I mean, some tournaments were bigger than others. So, I mean, they wouldn't make that for like just a, a little weekend thing. But if they were running a tournament that, you know, was regional or once, you know, once every quarter or something, you know, and you had a lot of people showing up. Yeah, they could they could make that kind of money. But again, you know, I suppose if you were traveling from store to store, you could maybe make an income if you're you're getting a thousand from this store and a thousand, but it really doesn't work that way, right? There's not going to be a regional tournament in the same area, at two different stores in the same month. That's just not how it works. You know, a store either picks it up and they get picked to do it, or it's it's already determined by the company where it's going to be done. So, but again, that that is that is income. So let's say you're somebody who you build terrain for a game. Let's say something like Infinity. You know, and so you every month you work on a piece, say 500 bucks. Let's say you're authorized to run tournaments for Affinity or Infinity. 
and say you run some some local in store stuff every month, you know, where you maybe get a hundred bucks at four different stores. So that brings you another four hundred with your seven. And then maybe every three months you do a bigger one where you get a thousand or twelve hundred dollars. Okay, so that would average out to like an extra three hundred a month. So now you're up to about thirteen hundred a month. It's close. I mean that's close to something you could live off of. You know, I would say let's say you paint some, but I don't really see you would have time to paint a bunch of miniatures if you're also building terrain. So I think those would cancel each other out. You're you're either painting and selling that on the side and then running the tournaments or you're gonna be building terrain, you know, throughout the week and running tournaments on the weekend. And I would say the same thing about writing or authoring, right? Those are kind of the things that would replace doing the tournaments. So whereas one guy may do these magic tournaments and say every quarter he makes 1200 bucks, which is like 4800 a year. Another guy may have a gig with a, a company where he writes rules for them. And he puts out one set of rules a year and say he makes about 10 grand. So, again, this is money, but it's not going to pay your bills. I mean, if you figure the average person needs 2500 to $3,000 a month just for a modest living... Right, just to pay for your bills for a modest living, we're not there yet. Like I said, we were at seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, then the three. So that's like fourteen hundred. So we're still about a thousand dollars short. And I'm pretty much almost out of ideals. I mean, you could say stuff like oh a podcast, but honestly, you're not I don't know any podcast on wargaming that generates any real income period not even game companies put the podcast they do generate any income uh, but there's one other thing okay one other thing which you know I'm gonna I'm gonna throw this out there and that is you know buying and selling Products, you know, your wargaming or miniature or hobby products. Now, you have to understand, I mean, buying and selling. Because just selling your stuff or your extra stuff or stuff you changed your mind about is not going to bring enough money in either to pay bills. So you would literally have to be in the hobby, maybe hitting stores, hitting conventions, flea markets putting ads out to other buyers buying their stuff and then selling it online and that I think could put you over the top because depending on what you're getting you know you can make about a thousand dollars a month doing that you know just average type of selling stuff say you get a GW box set kilting and somebody sells you his kilting box for you know 60 bucks say he opened it never played it you know, you might could resell that on eBay or somewhere for two hundred dollars. So you do that four or five times in a month, and you're gonna have your thousand dollars. So, but it's not guaranteed. There's no guarantee you're going to find the type of stuff that you can sell every month. And if if you are dedicated and you're just out there twenty four seven looking for this stuff, you're not gonna have time to do the other stuff. I guarantee you, you're not going to have time to, to go out and find the stuff that will make that kind of money. You know, prep it, get it ready, count it, sort it, make sure it's complete, list it, describe it, sell it, and ship it. Right? Plus, build terrain or paint miniatures or run tournaments. And so, again, you're probably going to be stuck in that $1,000 to $1,200 to $1,300 a month range. And that's kind of where you're at. Like, whatever we add up, we wind up at the same place. And so just think about that. I mean, if I'm missing something, let me know. Right? If it's something I'm not thinking about, let me know. And I mean, I got a few more things I'm going to throw out here. We're going to try to get finished. But, you know, if I think of them before we do, we'll bring them up. But as far as I know, I think that's it. And so I just want to give you guys a close-up of these. So these are some more of the North Vietnamese looking real nice. 
I will put them on bases later. They do come with bases, and uh, but I crazy glue them to there because even this stuff doesn't really hold them well. Like if they drop, they 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 just pop off. So I use crazy glue. Okay, guys. So we are on the last project of the night. It's about two thirty in the morning. So I kind of want to wrap up, start going to bed. But we are still working on this rice patty field. And so what I want to do is start getting some grass and terrain on here. These are some cheap dollar store brushes. You can't beat them for stuff like this. You just use them and lose them. And so I need to get this glue for the board. I should probably put some water in here. Okay. And I will say I did think of one more thing you could do to make money in your hobby. And that is actually playing in games or tournaments. Right? I do know back in the days when Magic the Gathering was pretty big, which I mean I assume it's still pretty big. But back when I was aware of the Magic tournaments, Pokemon, Yu-Gi-Oh! You know, actually playing at some of these tournaments, I mean, there were people who made good money playing at some of these tournaments. Uh, now, obviously, that's if you win, right? But, like, you could go to places like Origins, Gen Con, and register Adepticon. So, I mean, if you were good... I even remember when games like Mech Warrior had tournaments. I mean, some of them paid a thousand dollars to the winner, or they had a thousand dollars in prizes that were distributed between the participants. So, I mean, again, you're not gonna pay your bills doing in the tournament, you know, once or twice every summer, uh, and you you might make a thousand dollars because there's no even guarantee you're gonna win that tournament. But, I will say that, uh, you know, this thing never does what it's supposed to. Although, I don't think this is the right grass for this, to be honest with you. <clears throat> but, I will say that, uh, what was I going to say? That there's no guarantee that you're going to, you're going to, uh, you're going to win the tournament. And plus, a lot of times, by the time you go to those tournaments and you spend your money for the hotel room and travel and taking off work, I mean, even if you win $1,000, you probably spent $1,000 just getting out there. So, I mean, have you really won $1,000 or did you just get reimbursed for the trip out there? There are a few, few tournaments that I do know will, like, pay for the winners at regionals to come to nationals and things but I don't think that's I don't think that's the norm normally you just win a spot and of course it's up to you to show up I tell you what I bought this thing and I'm fairly disappointed with it like I don't think I've ever gotten the use out of this that you're supposed to get and I know somebody may say well you're using it wrong and I may be but I mean, I don't know how you use something wrong when all you do, all you're doing is pointing it, you know, and touching something with this and hoping the grass stands up. Now I don't think this is the right grass, so I don't even know why I brought it out. Maybe just to show you guys I had one, but I've actually been thinking of selling it because I mean you can't use it on little bitty figures. Because the thing is so huge, you can't even, like, get it over the base. And, I mean, I don't do a bunch of terrain, you know, to that level. You know, somebody like, you know, maybe Terrain Tutor would definitely use it if he's building boards all the time. But, you know, for me, this thing might get out once a year. And then when it does, as you can see here... I'm not even using it right. Like, I could literally just shake this stuff on 
and not even worry about the whatever effect it's supposed to be having. I think it would be just the same if I just shook it on. And more than anything, I've gotten shocked by this because if these two points connect, you will get a big shock. I've learned that the hard way. But I don't know. I'm just figure if I'm not doing something right, if any of you guys are watching and you, you have one, please feel free to tell me in the comments. Man, I just got a pile of uh pile of green grass on my smock. But at least it saved my pajama pants because you do not want to try to go to sleep with a bunch of this green grass on you because you will be itching all night because most of this is sawdust most you may not realize but most of this green stuff is nothing but sawdust kind of the stuff from pencil sharpeners and if this stuff gets inside your pants or whatever you're going to be itching and scratching all night so my flock my flock actually saved me as you can see there so we just got this one section to do. I'm gonna try to do this right so I heard you're supposed to touch this so I'm touching the board and then you put this above it but I mean, it's not doing anything I could just shake this down like this and get the exact same effect although it is kind of good for a little shaker like that it just uses up a lot so we got that done and I needed to do that and then this is going to be the uh, the actual field although I'm trying to see is there a way I can get some of this back in my tub or am I just gonna have to vacuum it up <laughs> you know how we are we hate to waste stuff even though I got plenty of this so I'm not going to worry about it right now <clears throat> alright so now I want to do the inside of this but I don't like that brown so what I have decided to do is take my Mod Podge and some darker brown which I do like but I don't have much of this this kind of walnutty brown so I'm hoping this Mod Podge will kind of extend it now this is the luster so this should uh, this should give me the effect I, I want and we're just gonna go in here just like this Mod Podge and brown paint and I'm gonna get as much use as I can out of this because this stuff is expensive so I just wanna color it I don't need to cover it and so I think what well, I figure we've got about four or five more steps on this Vietnam rice patty but you can guys can already see what is this day four you know it's a lot of stopping and starting and letting things dry you know you can't just try to plow through this in one night because it is it you you will you will just mess it up and then you'll get upset and throw it away and just decide well I can just use a brown piece of uh, brown paper bag as my rice patty not that anything's wrong with that <laughs> as they used to say on Seinfeld but uh, so you can see it does have a little bit of a luster and so I'm just mixing this Mod Podge in and then doing this this is actually a little bit lighter than the other one but I don't think it'll show up that much so it also not only does it extend your paint but you know it gives the paint that luster so 
the center of this will have a water effect. Now I do have a medium that I can put on here that is supposed to kind of give it a dazzle. I just don't know if that would be too much. So I'm going to do this and then wait. And if this if this dries dull, then I will go over this with that medium. I will mix some of that medium with some of this paint and go over it with that. Uh, so, and see, one of the nice things about the different colors is it doesn't look like you painted it. It actually will make it look like it's a a real muddy feel with different depths. So that was kind of unintentional, but it's actually a good effect. A little more of this glossy Mod Podge. Now, one thing you should realize, they do sell Mod Podge in the dollar store. But a lot of times the one in the dollar store is not the luster. So make sure you check that. Uh, because I think I had to buy this at the craft store like Michael's or, or uh, Hobby Lobby. Because I noticed the one in the dollar store is, I think, a mat. And that will that will protect your piece, but it won't give it any shine. And so if you don't want to shine, uh, then obviously you can pick some of that up. Which I usually try to have one of each, which I don't know if I have any of the other ones. But you can see right now, this is, to me anyway... You know, this is kind of a decent little uh, feel. Now, one thing I'm going to do is the grass around the side, I think, is a bit too greenish. It's not dark. But I didn't have a lot of this. For some reason, this is all I could find. So what I'm going to do is just sprinkle some of this on. I'm going to wet some of this with some glue like here and then we're going to sprinkle some of this over there to give it more of a darker kind of Vietnam effect and I mean this will either work or it won't it's just gonna mess it up but I just thought this grass looked a little bit too too countryside and plus this matches more of the, the grass I have on my soldier's basis for here. Which is why I didn't want to try to use any of it. Even though it might have been enough. Uh, I didn't want to waste any because I'm going to need it for the rest of my soldiers that I'm still working on. So I figured, well, we'll just sprinkle some in here. And... Uh, you know, we'll take it from there so a lot of this stuff is just trial and error because I have not seen anybody build a field like this not a war gamer uh, so I'm just kind of going taking some of what I have seen from just your diorama and model guys and then kind of adapting it to my needs and that should be enough so so you can see what we got here right and then the last thing you would actually do is just run your fields that will look like you know that will look like uh, rice patties but I'm gonna let this dry and then we will we will do that part tomorrow after I see whether I need to do another coat of the gloss and so that is it for tonight guys you got to see me work on a little bit of everything which sometimes I like to do this just start grabbing stuff and say what does this need what does that need and just keep going alright guys hopefully I will see you guys tomorrow uh, if not uh, check back on the channel and see what I what I got up to tomorrow take care God bless